Okay, so now we come to the last one, the third one, on the hard disk. So hard disk is on the uh, short-term uh, visit uh, attachment to us. Uh, and she, in fact, she's now working on speaker recognition, the same subject here, but uh, we dis I discussed with her, and I think uh, the infant cry uh, talk <laughs> is more uh, interesting. So I invited her to, to uh, talk about uh, her previous work on uh, Detecting uh, uh, analysis of uh, of uh, infant cry. So how this uh, was uh, uh, work? She's a uh, associate associated lecturer in the University of New South Wales, and um, well, it, she's in the electrical engineering, engineering and, and telecommunication, te telecommunication uh, school. It's the same school that I am also affiliated with. And uh, Hardis also did a PhD degree uh, in uh, 2008 yes. uh, in speaker recognition. That's right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> That's why I'm here. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it was the same year as Bill. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and uh, uh, so two years ago, we, she also was a part of the team, mm -hmm. the I Square I for You team in the NISA evaluation. So I'm very glad to have her here to continue this uh, collaboration uh, this year uh, together with uh, the team in uh, Sydney. And, uh, so uh, today we will we'll invite her to talk about uh, a work that in fact we have not done much here but I think it will be good to, uh, to know some of these activities and to, uh, next time if we want to go on this and have some background. So let's uh, welcome uh, Artis. Thanks, Clancy, for your introduction. Uh, I know that everybody is now is a bit tired and <laughs> of speaker recognition, so I chose a different topic, something that uh, it's more uh, probably, you know, accessible, but it's very hard to make any decision about that. So, um, <laughs> happy conversion. I hope that this is the Alright, uh, need the sound? Uh, yes, I need the sound. Uh, need the sound. Can I the You can plug it into the lid. No, no, no. Okay, so <laughs> today I'm not going to talk about the result. It's more about what an infant cry can tell us. Is there any potential diagnosis? Why do we really need to have some sort of, you know, uh, analysis? on such a pure signal or very, very uh, primitive signal. So the background is mainly about that, uh, what and why people start to look at the infant cry. Pediatricians probably first try to look at different aspects of the infant cry to diagnose different pathologies. Because if you can detect pathologies in very, very early stages, especially the first six months of, of birth, then we can uh, improve them or we can avoid difficulties later on uh, in life. So uh, that was, was one of the main reasons that uh, nurses, pediatricians look into that. And then later on with the discoveries in signal processing, engineers started to collaborate with them and make the decisions more reliable, especially on recognizing different pathologies. But today, what we see is that now we are using it as a much modern, you know, luxury instrument. We can have some devices in the room and actually can tell the parents if this baby is crying because of discomfort, it's because of hunger, it's pain, or it is just pleasure cry, he needs some attention. So uh, as you see that, we just get lazier and lazier every day. So 
we need the machine to tell us that what our baby wants from us. So it's something which is very simple, but uh, now it has so many different applications. But it has started for a very good reason of uh, recognizing pathologies in infants. But the first person who actually uh, got the essence of infant crying was Blue. Blue, in his thesis in, uh, in Massachusetts Institute, actually found out a physiological and acoustical connection. Oh. Mm. Physiological and uh, acoustical connection between the cry production model. So he said that if we really want to interpret the cry signal, first of all, we should relate somehow the anatomy of the cry to the uh, signal of the cry. If we can find out what kind of acoustic measurement in the cry represent what kind of abnormalities in the anatomy, then we can say, okay, this, for example, kid or this infant is suffering from asphyxia. This infant has some sort of hearing impairment. And uh, this was kind of revolution which happened in 1980s and after that everybody followed uh, Gloob's model in cry production. The same thing that we have for the adults. So we have a speech production model, so we propose something similar to that which is the cry production model. And then from there, people started to figure out what are the best indicators in the cry signal which represent different pathologies or different causes of cry. And then they relate it back again to the physiological nature of the muscles. Which muscles actually motivates which kind of behavior or causes of the cry. So we go through all of these uh, topics uh, step by step. The first thing is that what is really cry? Cry is not just what we hear. It's a combination of act plus sound. So it's kind of motor activities that happens in the muscles that produces the cry and then the acoustic manifestation of those motor activities would be the cry sound. So the cry sound is the vocalization output of the cry act or cry motor activities, which happen simultaneously uh, in our body or, or in the infant body. So what we can say is that the part of the sound is very highly accessible. That's why this part has been used as a clinical tool to indicate various pathologies. We don't have access to the motor activities. We cannot say what, which muscles is working properly or not properly at this moment, but we have some sort of manifestation that we can rely on it. Um, the literature shows that uh, actually the pediatricians used it as a very, very powerful clinical tool. For example, for sudden infant death syndrome, which happens quite often, for example, in the United States, they figure out that the, if the first cry uh, has a very high format, first format, just the first uh, cry sound, and if the second cry sound of the newborn shows exactly the same pattern, then this baby is more likely to die from the sudden infant uh, death syndrome. And if we have some sort of the cry mode changes in the infant as well, then this risk goes up to 32% in infants. So that was a very good measurement or tool for sudden infant death syndrome, which can be avoided if we can recognize it in the beginning. For the hearing impair impaired infants, or the infants that actually they don't have proper uh, hearing, they figure out that because they lose the feedback of the auditory modeling, then they actually have different sort of cry patterns. So if you can recognize this in before six months of old, uh, six months of uh, age, then you can prevent the death by a tremendous amount 
even you can increase the amount of the vocabulary that this kid can learn in the future. So. Uh,